Ultraman G this week was simple, just adding Ultraman Zero to the cast through the proxy of Reito Igaguri. I have the wiki open up this week. Um, with Zero possessing him after Reito saves a kid caught in the crossfire of another Ultra battle. This specific battle involving a evil clone robotic creation version of Zero from his movies. I'm not that familiar with uh, a lot of the more recent Ultra series. I've, I've only seen a few of them, so I'm not... Kaiju Insane and Good, Evil... Darklops Zero, that's it. Um, Darklops Zero, that Yeed was in the middle of fighting. Zero broke it up, saw Reito's conduct that got him killed, and fused with him to save his life. This is something that goes back to the original Ultra series, where its protagonist fused with the titular Ultraman to also save his life, and thus became a host to the Ultra while on Earth. While it's never been established that... It was... Okay, rephrase. It wasn't established until the last episode that the original Ultraman was actually a sentient consciousness in Hayata. Hayata was the protagonist of the original Ultraman series. Um, but for the most part, it was just Hayata's actions, um, and then, in an episode, and then he would call upon Ultraman's power, and until the last episode, you thought it was him in control as Ultraman. Instead, it was Ultraman himself just stayed dormant until he was needed or called upon by Hayata in situations that required his involvement. Here, it's a bit more give and take in showing that Zero, since he is a full established Ultra with his own um, individual character divergent from anyone else, he is an active voice in Reito's head and ends up taking control of his body to beat up some thugs that Reito um, encounter. Now, there is a very fine line you need to walk with how you treat possession in storytelling. It, you need to have it show them to be kind of a symbiotic relationship. One provides something for the other. Otherwise, it becomes parasitic, in where one takes over and supersedes and does things with the host body that are against the wishes of its host or done involuntarily in, that in no way assists or helps them. The positive symbiotic type of possession seen its ways back and forth, but usually Yugi and Tem in the Yu-Gi-Oh! The original Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Admittedly, not so much the early side of the manga, but it, it eventually reaches there at some point, as I've kind of been discussing. The bad type of possession, where they hijack another's body, is pretty much one of my grievances with Kamen Rider Denno. I will explain that when I finally get to scripting a review with, of Denno. But the point is, you, whenever you use this, you walk a fine line with its storytelling in how, how far you, can you go without the character overstepping their bounds. And Zero, as he's a... I, how should I phrase this? As he's one of the more rebellious and rambunctious of the Ultra Legion, um, is a bit more boisterous, and it contrasts both good and bad against Reito's more... He's a more reclusive and reserved individual, like, you know, a, a normal person that likes to keep to himself. So, it makes him... I shouldn't say makes him. Um, Zero, when he takes control, makes him be more assertive, and thus ends up beating up a bunch of people with Reito not really realizing what he did until after it's all over. And, yeah, that's not exactly the best way to start off such a relationship. I mean, uh, he's try he was trying to do the right thing and protect um, Rachel in the circumstances, and it did seem like they would be attacking him, but it might have been taking things a bit too far to be, like, that obvious about hijacking the guy's body. I, I really didn't care for that, especially with the issues that happen with body possession stories or body swapping stories, where it just it gets creepy if you don't use it right, and... Yeah. Precedent in the series, I'm not saying that they shouldn't, they should not do it at all, it's just, um, I feel that they need to establish a bit more of a give and take with it, otherwise, as otherwise you 
get the hero that is doing villainous actions without um, explaining them away, or, you know, validating why he's doing them like that. Nonetheless, the AI, whose name I am forgetting off the top of my head, um, is there an actual thing for that? Rem. Yeah, Rem informs them that Zero is Balliol's prime antagonist, so he might have a beef with Riku, since Riku is Balliol's son. Thus, Riku tries to get the word out to Zero that he's not a bad guy, he's trying to help people, and that doesn't really go to much before they detect the next little star um, containing an Ultra Capsule within them, um, out and about using their powers. So Riku has to go and find them and keep them safe from the guy who's actually doing this, whose name I'm forgetting off the top of my head again, Kei Fuku Fukuide. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Ultraman Wiki, and me remembering to have that up this week. Um, so Kei summons... Um, actually, there's a bit of a funny aside here. Um, the kid they saved this week had a little... Um, I shouldn't say figurine, but it's like... Oh, it's kind of like a figurine. It's one of those, um... It's like a rubber character portrait image that you're supposed to hang on bags that they get out of gosh, uh, Gasha pun, uh... Gasha pun, what's the, what's the phrase, um... I'm totally blanking on this... device you find at the... Uh, the Big me of grocery stores, the, um, things that dispense little collectibles or useless things, and they're, is that, the, the Japanese word, of course, it refers to them as gashapon machines, but you, um, anyone's not that familiar with this, and I'm just rambling now because I can't think of the word I want to use. Ugh. Anyways, um, he, since Riku's a fan of this in-series tokusatsu hero, when he sees that, it's like, it's a bonding moment between him and the kid that gets the kid to trust him. Thus, when Dark Lop Zero reemerges, the, um, little star within him goes straight to Geed and kind of makes it feel pointless aside from new form edition of a... You see, I'm forgetting the name of the form now, but that... And it's sad because it is freaking, freaking awesome. Solid Burning Form. Solid Burning Form is... It's just, it's awesome. It's like, it's the best suit. It's the best suit with all, it's, it's brilliant. It's, I'm struggling to find the words to describe it. It just has like silver torso armor um, up about middle of the rib cage and on the shoulder pads and a bit of it on the, sh on the forearms and legs. And of course, silver helmet, but it's all the little detailing and the shades, um, also a red bodysuit aside from the silver stuff, but it's all the little detailing and little moments of musculature that make the suit really uh, cool looking. Um, especially since it, it's, a, it's a fusion of Ultra 7, Zero's father, and Ultraman Leo. So it's a combination of the powers, but it doesn't really reflect both of them to my memory. I mean, Leo's the one with, um, fire powers from last week's, um, Ultra Star that they gathered, whereas Ultra 7's abilities are more reflected in, um, Geed's, like, use of a head rhymant as a weapon and how it attaches it all over its body. Um, when I saw the clip of this last weekend of it in action, not so much a clip, but, you know, a gift set on, uh, Tumblr, it, uh, the specific one I saw was, um, Guy detaching the headdress, which is the, um, <coughs> that's why I paused, um, it's it, removing the headdress thing called the Geet Slugger and attaching it to his leg, and the instant I saw that I thought, Fang Stricer! Because Kamen Rider Double in his Fang Joker form pretty much does the same thing. He creates the leg Fang Claw on his leg and then uses it as a slicing thing with powered by his kick, 
and Gate does the exact same thing, and that's not even his final attack. His final attack is opening up vents on his arm and shooting a, a ray of... Plasma bl Blast Enhanced Ultralight Energy to defeat his enemy. It's like, this is Sakamoto at his best with this stunt work. Hell, um, his chest opens up and fires lasers. He he has little vents on his back, so he has a jetpack. And it's like, this thing is so over the top, it's awesome. And sad, the sad thing is, it's not... No, I shouldn't say it's the sad thing, because well, we've, we've gotten images of all of... Ultraman Geats forms thus far. This is not even his final form, and it's the best looking of them. And it's, it's like, it's so cool. And I'm wondering where they're taking this now, because they didn't really give Zero and Riku a chance to really interact beyond Riku trying to give him notice that he's not a bad guy, he's not his father, he doesn't want to be like his father, he wants to help people, which will definitely make Zero, um, Hesitant, but give, willing to give him a chance from what I can guess of the general heroic character archetype. Even though Zero has something of a history of being, like, rebellious and not the best um, fitting to that Ultra. So, someone trying to come in for that, um, at least from what I know from reading up on Zero's character, I think he would be one of the more... Um, I think he would be cautious, but he would be willing to... Um, at least hear him out, because he kind of had a similar character arc, albeit, he, you know, he um, didn't go full-on evil, or his dad wasn't evil. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how this is continuing to go. Which brings us to x -Side. And I pretty much, okay, I didn't quite call all of this last week, but Muteki is gone again. So it means that everyone else is outpowered and um, outwitted by Kronos yet again because of this sudden creation of this reset power that no one can explain. Hal Kuroto doesn't even have an explanation for it. So they're pretty much in the dark with how that went. However, there's some odd lines in here as um, Masemune tries to complete the contract with this other company for worldwide distribution of uh, Common Rider Chronicle. Some of the line, um, essentially their deal breaks down because one of the, the um, requisites for it happening was them getting gamer drivers to help supply a new game that would act as DLC for Common Rider Chronicle because new Common Rider player character with a new game goshot and all that. Um, the dialogue implies is that this is a point in, is that because of the set, the resets, the timeline for the series has now split. Had Masamune not done the sudden, um, had Masamune not learned the re, I shouldn't say learned either, had he not gained the reset ability, things would have gone on as they were supposed to, Common Rider Chronicle would have been broken, and... This other company would have come in with their um, thing and led into the events of the movie. What it, what this is implying is that um, we're in a new timeline. I shouldn't say new timeline since it's still main timeline. We're in a timeline where that doesn't come to pass. Now, my question for that is: they're still get fighting Game Deus in the movie, and they're fighting Game Deus now in the rest of the series. So it would make sense for it to be a divergence point if he is still a threat. However, they might be faking us out with that, as, you know, true ending is um, gamer slang for the alternative best ending. A lot of games that have multiple endings have a bad ending, a neutral ending, a special ending, like the UFO ending from the Silent Hill games, and then the true ending where you have the absolute best win condition scenario for everything, if you've done everything or taken the right path in all of these things. The pacifism route in... Um, Undertale is considered the true ending. The facing Izanami no Olkami ending in Persona 4 is considered the true ending to that, as you're getting the actual best, uh, the actual instigator of that a whole conflict dead. Um, shipping with Black Rose and Adelie is considered the true ending for 
the original Dot Hack games and Dot Hack GU, when I bring up Dot Hack GU as again because I've been going squee over the new news about Last Recode that's been dropping the net last few days. I was like, oh, it's a chainsaw, I am so excited. Um, but that's game talk. This is um, time for Toka Talk. But, uh, yeah, this is, this makes sense to me, but also kind of annoys me. You know, my, my opinion of that will probably solidify once we actually get tangible news about the storyline for the movie, because... Bar the Tyson movies, there hasn't really been a Kamen Rider movie that's been out of continuity with its main series in a long time. And by long time, I mean, I think the last one was... Some people count O as wonderful, and I understand that. I also understand people saying movie work core on that as well, because there are continuity errors all over the place that makes it hard to place within the main timeline, even though there is a continuity error in around episode 40 of O's that kind of accounts for both of their events. The Spring movies are continuity crapshoots, so I'm not even trying to pretend those count anymore, even though Toei is still insisting they are, even though they've done the whole retcon thing to make sure they never actually happened, and now I'm just getting off of my tangent, but... My point is that a Kamen Rider movie hasn't done this in a long time. Some would say Wizards movie in Magic Land, because they made it to have never happened at its end, because most of it was set in an alternate universe. And the Fruit Soccer Cup had a tie-in to the series, which explained that, yeah, someone's just mucking with reality and people's perception, so it never happened, but it did actually happen. That is... Okay, it didn't actually actually happen, but there were events tied to it that actually did happen, but they weren't all happening in the real world, and my brain hurts. My brain hurts, and I'm usually so very good at explaining these things. Bottom line, we haven't had a um, Kamen Rider movie that has intentionally set itself in a divergent timeline of things since... Yeah, oh, I can't... No, no. That was the modus operandi for the Heisei Rider series through Kabuto. We, okay, from Ryuki through Kabuto, I should, I should specify, as those movies take place with events um, mixed up from what was shown as possible in the settings. Like, Fi's Paradise Lost it occurs in a reality where... The show went off the rails at some point and led to the led to the setting Paradise Lost. Um, Ryuki episode final is just another timeline's take on the whole Rider War. Um, Blade missing Ace takes place in a timeline where Blade did not become an undead and so had to seal Chalice. That that kind of thing. That's what it keeps getting implied is occurring for. Um, XI with the movie True Ending, and this is where that divergence point comes in. Masamune refusing to partner with them after the timeline reset kind of botched his whole um, uh, deal, which had been seeded. My problem with this is, if it's going to be in its all separate time space, I like how you're placing where it would diverge in continuity, but if it's going to be its own separate canon that's never actually going to happen with regards to the main series, then you kind of didn't need that. You can make a, like, a, you can reference it directly at where the seed point might, would diverge, but you didn't need to make the movie antagonist a playing character within the full series as he is guest spotlighting throughout this entire episode. Um... That's my rant on that. Um, but otherwise, everyone else is dealing with having no Muteki. And Kuroto just thinking, yeah, I should probably just go and make a new one. He dies 18 times in the episode doing that. His life counter got reset due to the reset. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, if it went all the way back up to 99. I'm guessing so, because uh, Kuroto keeps making jokes about how he's killing himself, and this was actually a bit painful to sit through. Not because of the whole suicide uh, thing as a story device I have issues with, but 
this is something that actually happens in Japan. Due to bad working conditions and stress, people literally work themselves to death. This is actually a common thing, and I'm forgetting the actual name for it. Kuroshi... Um... Kuroshi. Yeah, um... Now I'm looking at something else. Kal Roshi. I was close. Kal Roshi. Yeah, it's the it's the principle of someone working so hard and being so tr stressed at the job, they just drop dead, and that happens with Kuroto several times in this episode. Now, it's pretty obvious why they were allowed to make this joke. Je death is immaterial to Kuroto, as he just respawns from his continue pipeline after every death. Death has lost meaning for him, but you're still showing a main character kill themselves out of overwork, and that is very dark. That is, like, even just regarding, like, age group demographic stuff, that is disturbing even for an adult to see, to sit through, and it's kind of a tasteless joke when you take it into a cultural perspective, so I don't think that was a good decision with regards to how they're treating Kuroto's manicness in trying to recreate and upgrade Muteki so it can't be wiped away by the power of reset. Now, this episode does not at all answer the, the root question I had for all of this. Why was Muteki wiped away in the reset? It's a game cartridge. It's like it's like all of the other Gashots. There, None of the other Gashots went bye-bye in this. They were all established to exist. They're all part of Chronicle. Admittedly, it's the only one that was not authorized in some way by Genom Corporation matching how, you know, it's supposed to be a game genie, it's supposed to be a game shark. Those types of cheating devices are not authorized, and they are not licensed by the makers of those games or the platforms they run on. They are um, widely distributed cheat devices. So, from that context, if he's resetting the entire game environment and everything related to it, does that mean because it's an illegal product, it wasn't carried along for the ride, even though it has the core programming in it from the creator of the game system and knowing all the ways to hack those systems that it's like he should have had some type of programming within it to supersede it. I mean, it is a full functioning Gashot, after all, like all of the others, and the entire Common Order Chronicle system is run on those Gashots and the Master Gashot that... Um, Masamune has. If it can interface with this system, it should be immune like all of the others because, hell, they all run on data that was created from Emu. So, it disappearing like this makes no goddamn sense. It really does not. All it does is facilitate uh, getting rid of this newest Deus, Deus Ex Machina through the collaborative efforts of Emu and... Kuroto to create an add-on extension to the game, to Muteki, where it can create save states. Now, um, I heard about someone complaining about this, um, a while ago, like, I shouldn't say a while ago, within the last week, when the episode first popped up, where they were complaining about Muteki not being able to save its own damn game, part of the whole thing about them needing to recreate it. And I'm thinking... It's a game genie. It's it's literally supposed to be mimicking a game genie which docks on top of a game cartridge to... or the game cartridge docks on it, depending on how, how you configure it, um, to provide cheat codes. And I'm like, why would it have save states? Save states has only been a recent development of things through emulation software, where since you're running it on something else other than the original platform it was running on, you can pause the entire system, pause the entire emulation system, and, like, 
save it externally to an external memory thing that you just reset it to afterwards. So that was not a original thing that cheating cartridges could do. Their entire internal memory was saved for the cheats. So why are they thinking that they should have this as an automatic feature? I don't get it. But um, yeah, this is how they um, remove the power of reset by Muteki now being able to give everyone save states that if they just reset, that's the limitation that um, uh, Kronos's reset can set it to, reset it to, meaning it's pretty much worthless as yeah, they did it right at the point where um, Nico, Taiga, and Kagami were summoning Game Deus after defeating Graphite. So, you kind of screwed yourself as now you can't actually reset to anything before Game Deus is summoned. It's just you're at the. You, you can only go back as far as when he's summoned for the first time. So, if Game Deus becomes a threat to you or any of the others, you're stuck in a catch 22 of always going back to the point where you're past the point of no return. This is usually where you don't use save state software, so if you need to go farther back, yeah, that's not going to work anymore. So, I should probably address that subplot. The other thing that goes on in the episode is Taiga, Nico, and Kagami, since, you know, they have no other options because they don't realize Kuroto is recreating Muteki, is the way to beat Kronos is to just have him... In, enter in battle or in conflict with Game Deus, so, you know, he couldn't be focused on killing all of them. And they have to do so by either getting Graphite on their side, because Graphite can fight Game Deus, not Game Deus, can fight uh, Kronos now, because Game Deus' virus has allowed Graphite to not be stuck in pause. Or, you know, um... Or defeat him so they can summon Game Deus and have Game Deus sort out that crap. So, but this is the more... This is kind of dumb for them to do because they know Kuroto's recreating Muteki. It's like, you're exasperating the situation when your alternative win condition that was originally supposed to be Kronos when dealing with Game Deus to clear Common Runner Chronicle is, like, not available. And, okay, I can get... Taiga's motivation. He's wanted to settle the score with Graphite since the beginning of the series. It's like, he can't move on with it, but at that specific moment was probably the worst possible time. Kagami, however, it's like, he owes Taiga a debt for him being a dick for so long. So he's with them in fighting Graphite to the end. But before all of that, um, Parade and Poppy try to get through to Graphite in getting him as an ally to fight Game Deus, but, like, Graphite really doesn't want any of it. He has no interest in defying his fate as an antagonist game character. He, his, the game he comes from has him as the final antagonist, the final, um, hunter. He lives for battle, and he embraces his role as a game character in conflict as he feels that battle is the best way to, um, represent oneself. So, this is finally the point we get nuanced to this character who's been part of the show since the beginning, and you realize he's a really interesting character, and he's dead now. What the hell? It's like, one of my complaints about XI so, uh, throughout its entire length is its treatment of the bugster antagonists as more than any other show, these monsters have been neglected in favor of the relevant common Rider antagonist of the story arc. For the first 12 episodes, it was Genom. Then, through episode 24, it was Genom Dangerous Zombie. Then it was Paradox level... Okay, Paradox came in around episode 16, so there's a bit of an overlap with that. But Paradox consistently, through the entire creation of the common Rider Chronicle arc and the early days of the common Rider Chronicle conflict... And then we have Kronos, who's been at it since episode 32. 
so he's essentially a common writer, antagon a antagonistic common writer, an evil common writer, even if they later become um, allies, has superseded the entire way the actual antagonists of the series. Now, this isn't an ex entirely unprecedented since Ryuki, and to an extent Gaim, and to an extent early Heisei shows, because they kept freaking repeating this, but, um, it makes the actual purported villains of the series seem like they're completely inept if they're always sidelined for these longer-term antagonists. Graphite was beaten by episode 10 originally, then he came back, then he did pretty much nothing throughout this entire arc aside from being the occasional fight, and now once his final fight is over, the most you get is nuances to him being a battle freak and just, um, like Parad, wanting an even fight to, like, close everything with. Not, not like, permanently, but his death and deletion are are what he wanted. He wanted to be bested. He wanted to be that final challenge for a competitor and to put it all on the line. Whether he lived, whether his opponent lived, it was up to their own strengths and abilities. And that's that makes for an interesting character, even with how simple it is, and you see it you see it consistently with how he helped bait that rivalry with um, Taiga and how it showcases the, I would not say nobility, but the the rules of life the Bugsters um, live by where it's, in, from their perception, everything is inevitably a game and there's no shame in losing as a Bugster to your opponents. I'm not, I don't think I'm phrasing this exactly, but um, it's consistent with how he's been depicted. It's consistent with Parod's actions and Poppy's actions, even though they're reaching for more, and Graphite is saying he doesn't want more. This is exactly what he wants. And I like the symbolism he showcases or discusses with um, Kagami and Taiga in what their motivations for fighting him is, because Taiga's stuck on the past, uh, Kagami's once he's now killed his girlfriend, even though, ironically, his girlfriend is standing right before him because Graphite has her memories, um, is striving for a new unbroken future, and um, Graphite is someone who lives in the moment, so he is the perfect antagonist to bridge the two. He has been all series ever since the group collectively used Dragonite Hunter, the Dragonite Hunter Gashot, to battle him back in episode 10. So I like how he acts here in, um, after being defeated and, and unable to move and about to be uh, KO'd by Nico um, using Taiga's Gashkan Magnum with her Kamen Rider Chronicle Gashat to um, end him, that he is more than willing to accept that loss and hates that Kronos is intervening to keep that death from happening and keep the entire game in stalemate where Game Deus will never appear, even though by the previews for the next episode that he's trying to be get he's now going to try and get Game Deus on his side. Because reasons. So yeah, I like his death knell. I like how he's defying Kronos in his own way by not letting his um, own personal goals and his role in the game to be twisted. And it makes me wish he'd been more than a background recurring character throughout the series. You know, it's all the same damn problem. They, they've not used their non common writer villains well. But yeah, because this is the last Gasha trophy they needed to um, get to Game Deus, Game Deus now descends on the world, and everyone is horrified, and everyone is panicking, and I'm thinking, why did you not wait 
why did you not wait? You could have gotten away from Kronos and done this at a time where you were all in the best possible shape, since XI shows up with Muteki and beats down Masamune, so he's incapacitated, they can take his monster Gashad and shut down the entire game without any more... any more fatalities without even getting to game days. So, why'd they do it? Why'd they do it? I mean, they needed a last antagonist for the 42, 43, 44, 45. Four episodes the show has left. And from preview information, we're getting Kronos fused with Game Deus, so we know how that's ending. But, um... I'm not seeing the reason why they need to go through with it. I, I still prefer my headcanon of Game Deus' viruses, virus infecting, like, Masamune and doing him in that way. Like, it make it manifesting from him instead of um, then going through all of the Gasha trophies. So, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, in my opinion on this case. Um, other news. Uh, double reviews are ending this weekend by them going publicly. They'll be wrapping up on YouTube next week. Um, past that, I will be getting my reviews of O-Ranger from last year, and also Power Ranger Zeo, that I also did last year, up on YouTube. I'm actually re-rendering a few of them because the original cuts for them didn't quite work for pa getting past YouTube's content ID system. So, those will be waiting for when I start releasing them eventually. Um, there's some other things going on that I will be putting in another video. Please wait for that. And... Otherwise, I'm writing. I'm beginning the writing of the scripts for Kyoryuji in um, for the end of the year. I've got the first video done, the script for the first video done, and the second video. I'm working on the on starting up the third one right after. Actually, I'll probably have that one done by the time this video goes up. But yeah, I'm I'm progressing through them. I'm surprisingly don't have as many complaints as I thought I would, but then again. Kill Readers or Riku Sanjo series. People don't give them enough credit where it's due. That's all I've got. Oh, oh yes. Um, the new information about Build, in that they gave the plot synopsis for the show, the uh, look into the forms and how he transforms. I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. It's like, internet reviewer Marskull has been calling him Stuff the Guy, and he kind of is, but... From everything we've seen so far, I think it's going to be working for him. So, kind of hyped for build, and that's starting at the beginning of September. Looking forward to it. That's it all I have now. I'll see you all later.